Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I welcome you to the second international symposium on application of AI in metallurgy and materials. So let, let me share you uh, the screen. This is the second webinar on the uh, weekly, uh, weekly uh, webinar. And this is a webinar to alloy and process design using artificial intelligence or AI. So today we will have uh, four speakers to, to give us a, a insight into the application of artificial intelligence in metrology and materials, and especially in the aspect of alloy and process design using the AI. So first of all, I would like to introduce the organizing committee and our chair and co-chair of this symposium. Um, this is first series of this, uh, the first symposium is actually uh, organized by University of Science and Technology in Beijing. And this is the second uh, symposium of the international uh, meeting on application of artificial intelligence in metallurgy and materials. The symposium chair is Professor Hong Biaotong from University of Leicester. And the co-chair is Professor Jian Xin Xie from University of Science and Technology, Beijing. And I'm a, a, a chair of organizing committee. And uh, we have uh, Jenny as a co-chair of organizing committee. Uh, we have Andrew Densmore, an organizer, and Dr. Hua Dong Fu from University of Science and Technology of Beijing, and last but not least, our uh, conference manager, uh, Risha Jadeja, and uh, from University of Leicester. So, the previous uh, webinar on application of AI for material science engineering attracted a lot of attention for the community to actually uh, realize about the application of AI in 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 metallurgy and materials and there is given by Professor Harry Badesia and, and Hong Biao Dong on, on the topic. And today we would like to introduce our four speakers who, who is actually Professor Ian Crispy, a Pro Vice Chancellor in Research and Enterprise from University of Leicester and Professor Jian Jiang, uh, a professor of material, material science and tech engineering from Shanghai University, and Dr. Richard Curry, program manager from Swansea University, and, and myself, China Parpanwisawas from University of Leicester. So the program of the to, to today webinar, we will have, um, uh, firstly, we will in, uh, start from the keynote talk by Professor Jian Yang, from Shanghai University on the topic of uh, development of artificial intelligence, methodology technology based on da big data. And the, our invited talk by Dr. Richard Curry uh, from Swansea University on the topic of digital manufacturing within sustained future manufacturing research hub. And then last but not least, I will give talk on the computational material science of metal additive manufacturing from fluid dynamics to digital material design. And then we will start our panel discussion, basically a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So if you have any question, please feel free to leave your question in the question box and indicate who you want to answer this, your question. So may I introduce Professor Ian Crispy is a pro vice chancellor in research and enterprise at University of Leicester, who would uh, like to, he, he will be the, 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 the person who welcome, uh, give a welcome speech to, to everyone here. So could, uh, may I introduce uh, Professor Ian Christie and then thank you very much indeed.
of the blowing, and we should charge a lot of raw material into the converter. So it is a rather uh, complicated uh, process. So, and uh, we should to develop some and uh, automation and uh, operations then to uh, master this process. And we have developed one key BOF steel making um, technology and uh, it is include and the automation control system of the oxygen blowing and the lens position and the bottom blowing and the raw material weighting and charging and the sub uh, measurement and the convert mode technology and to develop one key BOF steel making. So, and uh, for the conventional BOF blowing, we use the 147 keys. And, uh, and we just can use one key and uh, for, the, uh, for the operation of the BOF steel making now. And uh, for the IH refining automation technology, uh, we also uh, must develop automatic control of the argon gas blowing and the top line system and the vacuum system and the ferro uh, arrow addition. And we also uh, have to develop the IH core model. And uh, for the top line system, now we can use the one key. And for the iron gas system, and uh, it is also key free. And uh, for the vacuum system, it is also just one key. And uh, for the ferro arrow system, and uh, it is uh, after calculation confirmation, we can use, uh, also use one key. And the IH core motor um, for the mode and error for the real time temperature as, uh, estimation and the dynamical decarbonization motor is quite accurate. So the future direction of the IH refining is develop the one key IH. And uh, about the optimization of the rolling process parameters and based on the GPS systems of multi-process coordinated control in rolling um, process and the multi-mechanism, um, multi-process dynamic coordination matching and uh, it is about the real-time forecast technology was the cross-section temperature field. And it is also about the multi-process shape, presetting, and the comprehensive matching control technology. Also about the integrated control of the hot rolling, cut rolling, and the continuous cutting and yielding. So for the steady state process, uh, we can develop the accurate quality control. Uh, for the automatic control of the uh, cyclics, for the vitreous, and the, for the shape, uh, for the fishing rolling temperature, for the uh, cooling temperature, for the combustion in the furnace. And uh, for the unsteady state process, we can also and, uh, get the accurate quality control and for the head and the tail short stroke control, for the dynamic setting control, for the intelligent control of the plan shape, for the adaptive control of threading, for the wide direction temperature control, for the dynamic control of strategy. And about the artificial intelligence in material design, and uh, you know, and the property of the materials is determined by the microstructure. And the microstructure is also determined by the compositions and the process uh, of the matters. So, and uh, it is uh, the inherent laws of the materials are very complicated. And so this process should be optimized by the artificial uh, neural network. And uh, for the required properties, we based on the database and uh, we get the evaluation and uh, from the uh, artificial neural network 
and uh, from our knowledge, and uh, we make this uh, verification. So we can accelerate and the design of this kind of materials. And for the optimization of the material procession, and uh, uh, for example, we use the artificial uh, neural network and to assist in the optimization of the um, process, producing process, and for the conventional one and for the optimized one, and uh, we optimize the annealing, uh, annealing temperature, annealing time, and the solution temperature, solution time, and so on. So we can get and uh, much different or much better and uh, the well surface morphology of samples and uh, we can also get the uh, fracture surface of the impact samples and the impact energy is improved uh, from 29 uh, joule to the 42 joule and uh, the second part of my presentation is about the development of AI metallurgy technology uh, based on big data. And uh, the firstly, uh, about the, the uh, prediction of the KR and Canberra reactor desulfurization endpoint. So the problem is the low prediction accuracy of the desulfurization endpoint results in no production efficiency and the high production cost. So to solve this problem, we use the AI technology and the combined with big data uh, to make the prediction of the desulfurization endpoint. And uh, the intelligent optimization method of the desulfurization process uh, was developed. So we use uh, three kinds uh, of the motor. The first one is a multiple linear regression motor. The second one is the artificial uh, neural network motor. And the third one is a simulation, a linear particle swarming uh, of optimization. So it is uh, uh, and this three motor. You see this three motor, and we can make the prediction of the KR desuperation endpoint. And here is the KR process. And you know, it, and there are impeller and with the impeller inserted into the hot matter and the, and the rotation, uh, rotate it and the, to stir the hot matter and the snack. So uh, they can mix the snack and hot matter and uh, to desulfurize the hot matter or remove the sulfur uh, from the hot matter and uh, the uh, flow up to the stack. So, and uh, it is the industrial data analysis uh, for the endpoint of the sulfur content. And uh, it is influenced by the lime weight and also by the hot matter sulfur and content. And uh, here is uh, endpoint prediction and the error analysis and uh, we use and the um, correlation coefficient and the mean absolute uh, relative error and the root mean square error to evaluate this three model which one is better and uh, it is show that and the sample ann and with the highest and the uh, correlation co coefficient and uh, with the lowest, the uh, mean absolute relative error and the rule mean square error. So this one is the best one. And uh, from the error box, you can also see, and the third one is the best one. So uh, we use uh, this, um, motor, the simulation and yielding particle swarm optimization motor and to predict and the effect of the process parameter on KRD separation ratio. 
And here is the effect of the hot matter sulfur content, line weight, and the hot matter temperature and the weight on the desulfurization ratio. And with increasing the hot matter sulfur content, the desulfur ratio is increased. And with increasing the line weight and the hot matter temperature, the desulfur ratio uh, is also increased. And, uh, and another one is the prediction of the line and the sufferization ratio of the KR and the based on big data, the line and the utilization ratio. So the power plan uh, is uh, in the KR desufferation process. Line is uh, easy to agglomerate and the resulting no line utilization ratio and the high cost. And uh, to um, solve this problem, we based on the industrial data and the artificial intelligence and uh, make the prediction uh, of the line utilization ratio. And uh, to optimize the desufferation process and determine the addition amount of the desufferation uh, flux. So uh, in the desufferization and uh, uh, with the lime, here is the reaction. The lime oxide plus the sulfur plus carbon um, to produce the lime sulfide and the carbon uh, oxide. So we use three motor and the one is a random forest. The second one is a support vector machine the third one is a convolution a neural network. And uh, we use, uh, at first, we make the data pre treatment. And uh, here is a, a correlation analysis. And uh, the one to the yellow color is a positive um, correlation. And the one to the blue color uh, is a negative correlation. And the size of the cycle uh, means the uh, strength uh, of the side and the strength of the influence. So, and at first, and uh, we should uh, use the person correlation coefficient we used to identify if the variables have the uh, great influence on the line utilization ratio. And the process data of KR and the desufferization is a one dimensional and discrete. So a convolution neural network cannot be used directly and it requires the transformation of the data. And we must uh, transfer this one dimensional data and to these two, and two dimensional images. And uh, here is a comparison of the prediction accuracy for the three model. And uh, you can see and, uh, uh, from the R, the correlation um, coefficient. And uh, the third one, the convolutional and uh, convolution neural network and has the uh, best and, uh, and accuracy uh, for the prediction. And here is a comparison of the mode prediction error. We also use the and the mean absolute relative error and the rule mean to square error uh, to evaluate these three model. Uh, you can also see the third one, the convolutional neural network and uh, has the lowest error and the error box, it is also uh, the best one. And uh, is the error distribution, the third model uh, is also the best. So uh, we use the third model and the um, convolution neural network and to analyze the effect of the process parameters on the line utilization ratio. And here is the sensitivity analysis of the process parameter. 
and the initial sulfur content and the amount of nitrate are the main parameters affecting the utilization ratio of nine. And uh, here is a factor of the nine um, initial sulfur content and the nine weight on the nine utilization ratio. And uh, with the increase uh, of the initial sulfur content, the nine utilization ratio is increased. And uh, with the increasing nine weight, the nine utilization ratio is decreased. And uh, okay, and, uh, I'd like to show you the time side and uh, strength um, and prediction motor of the X17 pipeline steel. And the power plant is the X17 pipeline steel has a very strict quality requirement so that it is difficult to control the stability of the tensile strength. So to solve this problem, we use uh, AI technology and the combined with big data and to make the mechanical property uh, prediction. And to compare various modeling techniques and to find the optimal model. And this time we use the six motors. The first one is the Bison Regulation Network. The second one is the uh, radio basis function and the neural network. The third one is the stepwise regression. The fourth one is the rigid regression. The uh, uh, fifth one is the uh, uh, support vector machine. The sixth one is the red forest. And, uh, and here is the uh, tensor strength and the prediction model of the X17 pipeline steel. And uh, about this six motor, about this six motor, and uh, the sixth one uh, is the best one. And uh, the artificial intelligent uh, algorithm is better than the multi uh, linear regression algorithm. And uh, the red forest performs the best. And there uh, is a uh, and, uh, very uh, no error distribution, narrow uh, distribution, and uh, uh, very small error. And uh, I also like to show you the prediction of the impact energy of the no carbon steel. And the problem uh, is the impact testing is a time consuming and labor consuming and high cost. And the ability of a shallow uh, neural network is limited to fit some complex relationship. So the solution is a, a mechanical property prediction model and based on a deep learning technology. And uh, to find the high accuracy mechanical property prediction technology to assist the process design. And this time, uh, we developed the 16th model, uh, model. And uh, it is divided into two groups. Uh, one is a shallow uh, neural networker. Uh, and the second group is a deep neural network. And uh, here is a modeling data distribution and uh, about the carbon content and the silicon and the manganese and sulfur phosphorus and so on. It is the modeling data distribution. And uh, at first, um, we must uh, do some data pretreatment and uh, the data uh, normalization uh, was done. And also the data equalization was also done. And we use, uh, we convert uh, the data into a more balanced data uh, by the normal uh, calculation. And uh, all of the data was divided, was randomly and divided into the three groups. And uh, into the training data, into the verification data, into the uh, testing data. And uh, here is the uh, uh, determination of the 
keep an uh, optimum parameters of a shallow uh, neural network. And uh, we can determine the number of uh, neurons in the mid layers. And uh, uh, for the highest and uh, spot, we can get the um, best uh, number of the neurons in the meta layers. And to determine the activation function, and this is the activation function, the second one, and the third one is the training function, and to determine which one is the best one. And uh, it is uh, judged and, uh, by the correlation coefficient. And uh, we also judged based on the uh, mean square arrow, we can also make the same judge. And the result is the same as the uh, 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 formal one. And here is a comparison of the prediction errors of the different uh, 16 different models. And the prediction accuracy of the deep um, neural network is higher than the shallow uh, neural worker. And this DNN is a deep neural network, and the ANN is a shallow neural network. And uh, the deep neural network uh, optimized by the Bayesian, and this one 16, has the highest accuracy with the smallest uh, error box and uh, with the uh, uh, smallest and, uh, and this error. And uh, here is the uh, uh, sensitivity analysis of the process and based on the Bayesian optimized deep neural network and for the low carbon steel with the thickness of the four and uh, 7.5 millimeters, the original snap thickness and the rough rolling temperature, uh, rough rolling temperature, this one, and the intermediate uh, snap thickness, this one, have the obvious effects on the impact energy. And uh, here, and I show you the using the semi uh, supervised learning to improve the prediction accuracy of the steel um, properties. And the problem is that the mechanical property test of strip steel is sampled for inspection. And data of some steel grade is in, uh, insufficient. So to solve this problem, we make you uh, full use of unneighbored uh, unneighbored data and uh, the unneighbored data is a data and uh, just uh, has the information of the compositions uh, with the process parameters but without uh, the information of the properties of the materials so we uh, make full use of this unable data combined with the semi, uh, semi supervised learning method and uh, add pseudotext text to the data and expand the data set. So, and uh, we use the deep neural network model combined with the semi supervised learning. So in this study, we compare these two models. Uh, one is uh, uh, Borden, is a deep neural network optimized by the Bayesian. And uh, the second one is Safer Borden, is a deep neural network optimized by the Bayesian and uh, semi-supervised learning. So, and uh, in this one, in the Borden, we just use the training data only the labeled data. In the safer burden, we use the trained data and use the labeled data and the unlabeled data with the uh, pseudo lab uh, label. And here is a comparison of the prediction accuracy of the different model. And uh, absolute relative error and the mean square error and to judge and to evaluate and uh, which motor uh, is better. Uh, you can see the red one is a safe burden. So and the uh, arrow uh, for the safe burden is lower than the burden. 
and the air box uh, is uh, small, smaller than the burden. And, the, and this arrow is also and is, uh, smaller than the burden. So this one is better. And uh, here is uh, the comparison of the prediction accuracy of the different model. And uh, you can see from the um, correlation coefficient and the second model and the prediction result of the safer burden and is better and then both model. And, uh, and the last one, I, I'm going to show you the materials and the constitutive equation. You know, the constitu and constitutive equation, it is very useful to study the mechanical behavior of the materials and to predict the deformation resistance of materials and to determine the rolling force. So uh, traditionally, we use the mathematical method, um, but uh, it is, has drawbacks uh, such as the large amount of calculation, and uh, it is very difficult to determine the optimal parameters. So and in this study, we use four models. The first one is the Arrhenius type equation. The second one is the parameters optimized by the and genetical algorithm. And the third one is the parameters optimized by the artificial neural network. And the fourth one is the prediction error of the traditional constitutive equation optimized by the genetical algorithm. And here is the result of the material and the constitutive equation. And, uh, and comparison and, uh, of the correlation coefficient and the mean square error and the mean absolute relative error. And you can see the uh, artificial neural network and uh, has the highest accuracy, has the highest accuracy. And for the mod modeling operation, the optimized uh, Genetical uh, algorithm is uh, and the uh, highest and uh, modeling operation. And uh, okay, and uh, I'd like to conclude my um, talk. And uh, for the development of the artificial and intelligence metallurgy technology based on the big data, now. Uh, on steel making, for example, the KR desulfurization, converter blowing, and the IH refining, and the F refining. And uh, we can do uh, some about the continuous casting and about the surface defect of the automobile exposed panel, about the surface crack of the C plate, about the center segregation of the C plate, about the uh, slab continuous casting and the billet continuous casting. And uh, about the and uh, rolling, the AI methodology can also deal with the uh, rolling force setting and the optimization of a rolling process and the optimization of the cooling um, process and optimization of heat treatment and the mechanical property prediction. And, uh, about the AI methodology for the materials, we can and do component design, and phase change design, microstructure design, relationship between the microstructure and the properties, and the mechanical property and the design. Okay, that's all for my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Professor Yang. Um, I would like to ask uh, anyone if you have a question, can you actually type it in the uh, in the chat box, and then we will pick up your question. I mean, in the panel discussion, so every question will will go to the last uh, last bit. So that the next uh, presentation will be given by Dr. Richard Curry. Um, Dr. Richard uh, Curry is uh, is is the Sustain Research Program Manager based at University of uh, Swansea University. 
and Richard has uh, his background in electronic engineering, biomedical sensor, and horography, lithography. And now Richard will give us some um, perspective on the digital manufacturing within the, the, the sustained future manufacturing hub that that he is actually uh, managed. And uh, please, can can the floor is yours, Richard. Thank you very much, Chinapa. I'm just um, trying to share this screen. Yes, um, please. Can everybody see that? Well, can you see that? Yes, yeah, yeah, I can see your screen. If you can put it in the presentation mode, that would be great. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. Right, so um, what, what I'm going to do is just give you a quick introduction to, um, to what S Sustain is, and then go into some detail on the, uh, the, the, the digital side of the work that we are doing. Um, it's um, it's quite early days in the project, so this you know it's not going to be um, you know so there's not going to be a lot of really good uh, you know results and and uh, and things to talk about. It's going to be more about the methodology um, that, that we're taking and, and where we're getting to. But um, before we get to, to to the digital, I just want to uh, to, to give you a, a quick overview of what what we are and, and, and what we do. So um, it, you know it's a it's a UK based um, project. Um, through um, our research council, um, EPSRC, um, and um, it uh, it also has the uh, top five by volume uh, steel companies uh, within the UK as part of the consortium. Um, and you know the importance of UK steel for UK manufacturing um, is is paramount. Um, I've put some numbers up there. You know, um, it's it might be quite small numbers for um, you know um, it, for for people in China, but you know in the UK and in Europe, um, these are you know quite um, quite quite large. Um, not that the UK are um, really you know um, a manufacturing uh, country like we used to be, but you know we we still do have our manu uh, our manufacturing um, industries as well. Um, so. Just to give an overview, you know, as everyone knows, um, you know, steel is very important. 75% um, of the, the grades um, that we use today didn't exist um, 20 years ago. Um, the amount of steel used globally, you know, it's roughly 200 kilograms per person. Um, there isn't anything that, um, that we use that doesn't incorporate steel. And steel is very important for the future in terms of electric vehicles, in terms of, uh, you know, the every industry um, really, but we've got to work to, to bring down the CO2 and we do that through various technologies and, and obviously one of those um, very important technologies is, is uh, digital. Um, the UK um, is in a bit of a climate crisis as is the world um, and in the UK we, we've basically just been outsourcing rather than, uh, than, than you know actually doing real carbon capture and storage or, or looking at the problem which is something we're, that we're really taking seriously. Um, the, the energy crisis um, in, in the UK is, uh, is, is growing. Um, as we shift more to uh, renewables, uh, we need to really make some decisions about how we're going to uh, power things like, uh, you know, the, the land transport, uh, freight, um, how, how, you know, we're going to do domestic heating and various things. Um, there's a waste crisis globally at the moment. And uh, um, as, as you see on this uh, quick chart here, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's quite clear that uh, the more um, developed and industrialised um, a country becomes, um, the, uh, the, the amount of waste that we, uh, or the resources we use um, increases. Um, and we need to do something about waste and we need to start, you know, thinking about circular economies and reusing things and, uh, and not just throwing them away in landfilling. Um, Sustains part of a series of projects, um, including Comet, the Rapid Alloy Prototyping Centre, the Active Building Centre, Specific and Sunrise, that um, are across uh, the, uh, the Swansea University and, and, and Warwick University, um, and um, each has its own part. And we're looking at various things such as, uh, you know, uh, using uh, photovoltaics and, and various other technologies for um, active buildings which would power themselves and also supply the grid so we don't just have point sources of power we distribute the power um, you know specific um, looks particularly at uh, the renewables um, and, and sustain is really focused upon steel and how we apply some of these things plus new ideas into into steel the project itself um, is a, as I said it's a collaboration between Sheffield um, Warwick 
and Swansea. And we also have other companies such as uh, MPI, uh, the Royce Centre, um, which is at um, Manchester and, uh, and Sheffield, um, and various other um, technology centres involved. Uh, we also um, engage with uh, the UK Steel uh, for, you know, for government lobby and policy, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, we, 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 we work with um, community and various other unions because we're also concerned about the people aspects and, and making sure that everything we do is sustainable, not just in terms of the product, but in terms of the people as well. Um, just a couple of slides to, to sort of uh, to, to give a bit more of a picture there. We're really driving the, the low TRL levels, the bright ideas, um, to then feed into other UK um, initiatives such as industrial decarbonisation, made smarter, you can read them there. But basically, um, we, Sustain is about developing bright ideas that can then be developed on the TRL scale and then be commercialised and actually make a difference to the industry. So Sustain is basically split up into two grand challenges. Um, one is carbon neutral and steel making, and the second is smart steel processing. And within this, these two areas, we have a series of themes and a series of projects or tasks where we actually um, we, we look at um, various um, key aspects of either process or technology and bring that into steel. So you can read them there. I'll, I'll not labour on that. I'm going to quickly go through um, you know some of these and then get into the uh, the interesting stuff for you guys, which is the digital stuff. So we're looking at creating a, a CO2 value chain in uh, the first task. We're looking at emissions and how we um, capture those emissions, how we separate them and how we turn them into new products. So, you know, capturing the CO2, separating out all of the, uh, the nasties that um, either um, would pollute the product or cause issues with the separation and cat catalysis and things. And we are looking to produce things like polymers, dyes, pharmaceuticals, fertilizers and proteins, various things from the waste emissions. Um, we're also looking at um, reusing waste. So, as you saw on a previous slide, there is a, a you know there's a plastics crisis within the, within the world. Um, we, we've got far too much plastics being um, not just landfilled but um, you know dumped in the sea in various other places. This plastic could be reused if you had um, the suitable carbon capture and storage on top of the the furnaces to to then take that away and do something positive with it. So we're not just emit, emitting it as um, a CO2 and also providing energy rather than fossil fuels that we then obviously have to dig out of the ground and use for the process. We're looking very closely at um, scrap or, or, or you know, recycled metals and looking towards not just um, you know, reusing these and downcycling them for low value products, but you know, how far can we go in terms of using 100% you know, scrap and, um, and, and creating the high value strip grades and, and various other grades that, you know, that we need to make. We're looking at doing this in a way that is, um, you know, circular economy based and um, hopefully, you know, within um, the next 10 years, the UK will be self-sufficient in terms of the, uh, the, the recycling of, of, of our metals. We also look at thermal efficiency. Um, so this is, um, this is basically um, not just the recycling and reuse of refractories, but extending the, the life. And we're also looking at key technologies for um, uh, I guess what you would call thermopiles for using refractories as generators. Um, this um, could be to to actually provide um, you know low level um, electrical energy for the plant, or it could be to power remote uh, sensors and, and various things like that. Um, task eight, um, which is based on looking at sensors, we're looking at new sensor designs, high temperature sensors, and also you know novel sensors to look at things such as the uh, the change in uh, uh, the, 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 the phase or the uh, you know the, the, the grains between uh, the, the, the different uh, the metals that we're producing so we have the feedback on the furnace um, and uh, in terms of temperature and, and speed and, and various things so we can actually you know have more, much more of a control over the uh, over the product um, than we currently do um, and the, the the final one I would quickly go through is um, looking at late stage definition and integration, um, how we can basically reduce the amount of alloying that we put into metals, and you know, can we use um, you know very similar feedstocks, but then differentiate at the end of the process? So this is really good because obviously you're not putting those extra alloying elements in there, you're not doing um, your separate processes batch for for different materials, 
through the process and also we're looking towards the recyclability um, of these materials so the more you alloy a material um, the more difficult it may be to recycle that for, um, for uh, various different uses. Right, so with that out of the way, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about um, tasks four and five, which focus upon um, the digital steel innovation cluster. And this is all about looking at the supply chain. Um, we're, we're really um, looking at uh, you know, digital twins for the supply chain, um, not just for, um, for, 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 for interest or data or we're actually looking at how we can model these things so we know what the properties are going to be like or if there are going to be any issues in the process and um, this will all you know come out um, through through the modeling um, we're looking at end-to-end um, -end supply chain productivity as well new business models disrupting supply chains um, new product fingerprints connected steel products we're looking at various um, technologies such as blockchain to, uh, to almost sort of police the um, steel. So you, you've got confidence and trust that the steel that you purchase has uh, you know, emitted um, X carbon or below a level of, of, of carbon dioxide or how much energy has been used to make that. And then um, using um, you know, key identifiers to make sure that you've actually got something that can be, that can go around the cycle, you know, um, ad infinitum without losing track of you know, where the various products have originally come from. Um, we're also looking at um, you know, data capture sensors, uh, internet of things to bring together the plants and to have much more information about the products that we're making. So the digital innovation supply, this digital supply chain innovation center looks at bringing together the capability of driven projects from academia and the problem driven projects from industry. Um, the whole process is it, it, it's starting from scratch, getting the guys around the tier, uh, developing the ideas through uh, regular workshops, um, ramping them up almost in a um, uh, in a similar fashion to, uh, to to Google Sprint and that sort of thing, but for, for developing ideas, um, you know, testing the you know, new, new minds of the into the, the results that into, into the uh, into the rest of the industry. So you know that the methodology for this is, is, is laid out here. Um, it's all about sort of monitoring, reflecting, um, looking at uh, the, the, the impact and the goals of what we do. Um, of course, we're looking at zero waste, carbon neutral steel making and smart steel processing, our two grand challenges, and then feeding them through, um, looking at what the potential outcomes could be, you know, what the short term outcomes could be, and then actually targeting the stakeholders and developing the outputs through that. Um, we're doing this um, through two PDRAs based at Warwick and a third PDRA researcher based at Swansea. Um, and we're also bringing in MSc students as well. Um, plus, um, I think there's one or two PhDs are currently associated with this project. So progress to date, as I said, is we've just really set this up. Um, we have um, in the supply chain side of things, we have done a little bit of development. COVID-19 and, and all of the issues around that have, uh, have slowed us down somewhat as well, because a lot of the UK plants have gone on furlough, but you know, we've still sort of pushed on and, and we've managed to do quite a lot given the you know, remote working and, uh, and ensuring we can actually you know, interrogate the systems and, and, and also talk to the guys who are, who are on the plant with the problems. Um, so we're developing new technologies based on deep artificial neural networks and probabilistic models for sequential decision making with applications in smart steel processing. Um, we're using historical data repositories as well, um, which we've got full access um, from across um, all of our steel makers. Um, in the UK, we have a, a complementary steel making um, industry. We don't have one we don't have two plants that make the same thing. So we do have a, a lot of data from a lot of different areas um, for a lot of different products and a lot of different processes, which we're feeding in. And we, we, you know, we're really starting to build some very strong models on each of the processes, which are obviously from strip steel through to longs, speciality steels and construction. Um, we're looking at novel reinforcement learning methodologies as well. And uh, you know, we're, we're, we're hoping this will be instrumental in delivering an AI system that's uh, able to automate and optimize uh, certain processes 
that are currently, especially in the steel industry, rely heavily on, on manual intervention. Um, so moving on from that, um, we're looking towards um, developing uh, sort of a two phase process, um, looking at demand supply and inventory process for the supply chain with enable inhibit analysis and demand profiling. Um, the second phase is looking at integrated planning and process design, um, and then modeling of the potential benefits within the supply chain. And then we're looking at um, the a pragmatic uh, method for the future that we agree with the, uh, with the companies that we're working with. I'm just moving on quickly because I, I know um, I've got a, a little less time than, uh, than original, originally I uh, had it. Um, so the second project is uh, task five, where we're looking at uh, through process models. And this is all about um, trying to um, develop models that, are, um, that we're able to um, run very, very quickly rather than, you know, very large, very complicated uh, models that um, require, you know, significant amount of computational time. Um, so both Richard Thackeray and Michael Owing are looking at methods for, um, I guess, picking out the key variables within um, each of the processes that we're looking at, and then using things like uh, machine learning and AI to, to assist with, uh, you know, with some of the variability. Um, so it's about fast computation um, to improve performance um, and to verify the accuracy. Um, the through process models are, you know, for inline optimization, identification of bottlenecks, and to link between individual processes. And then the process optimization side is looking at uh, to generate databases, very the verify the accuracy of the predictions, and to optimize the production of the, of the plants. Um, so basically, um, there's been many attempts um, in the steel industry and in academia um, in the UK and Europe across the world to do um, descriptive numerical and analytic computer simulations of many of these processes. And many of them are, are very complex and you're unable to actually run them in real time, um, even with today's um, computational um, performance. So there's a hand raised. I don't know if we're taking, are we taking questions through the presentation, Chinapat? No, we're just gonna get questions at the end. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep, take the presentation at the end. Yeah. yeah okay. If anyone, uh, ha have you finished uh, your presentation? Should... Not yet. I've got a few oh, not yet. Okay. Slides. Yeah. I'm trying. Sure. I'm trying to get through as fast as I can for you, just to make up a bit of time. It's okay. Um, it's okay. Yeah. Right. Take um, your time. Yeah. Thank you. So, as well as doing the um, the work that I've just described, we're also looking at um, the uh, sort of LCA analysis side of things as well. Um, so we're not just, um, you know, we're, we're not, we're actually, you know, joining, joining up the loop and we're making sure that what we're doing is actually um, low carbon emission, you know, low energy. We're trying to um, reduce the impact um, of, um, of carbon and also the, the you know, the, the energy used on the process and other things such as, you know, other resources such as water and, and you know, various other things. Um, so ultimately, with these things put together, um, we're, we're hoping that um, in you know a year or two we'll have a, um, mm. a coherent process level model for fast and efficient optimization. So here's a few examples of you know things that we, we we're working on currently, um, which include a, a model of the blast furnace, um, and um, we're looking at um, cooling behavior of porous media as well for uh, you know macro micro coupling of heat transfer. So to conclude, um, we are basically trying to turn the whole thing of steel being a problem, which it sometimes is seen as being um, in the UK and in Europe um, in terms of the carbon emission. Um, and we're looking at um, how steel, because of its complexity and because of all of the various you know, routes that are within steel making, how we can turn that into a solution rather than a problem. And this last slide just basically looks at the way all of the different tasks that I've, I've gone through very quickly um, link together and um, actually help to, um, to use the steel industry to solve some of the, the issues that we currently have um, within, uh, with, within the UK. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, as, as I said previously, if you have any questions,
question, please type it in. Uh, please, please, please type it in the uh, uh, Q and A or, or chatting box or Q and A box that that we will pick up in in the panel discussion. So from from now is is actually myself. I let me introduce myself as well. I'm I'm Chinapat Pandisawas. I'm I'm associate professor in digital manufacturing and also associate director of NISCO UK Research Center, where a professor Hong Piao Tong is 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 the light director and also I'm a, U, a EPSRC UKR innovation fellow. And today I want to give you some insight in the computational material science of metal 3D printing or additive manufacturing from the kind of first principle uh, calculation, but, but in a micro scale to how can we say about digital material design. And this one will bridge across the length scale from the, uh, actually the, the previous two talk is, is fantastic that give us some big picture and also some specific process from the first uh, talk from Professor Yang and, and give us some idea how can we use AI in the, the high level steel making process. And also from, from the, the Richard uh, point of view, they will give you some more idea about management side and then how can we bring across the, the tech, uh, I mean the knowledge from the laboratory to, to the, the real practice. And now I'm, I'm, I'm talking about what is actually happening in, in the very low length scale. And this, this is about my talk. So uh, the, 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 the thing I want to say first is that when you want, I mean, my, my, my experience in the past uh, 12 years or so is on this aerospace material. I'm, I'm busy thinking about what is the material behavior look like in the, in the very small scale. And this actually, when, when you, may, may, you may have heard about this uh, kind of form atom to jet engine. So we decide something from the very uh, in atomic scale and this atomic scale knowledge will give you some design in the component level. And this is very important that uh, material scientists will, will use this knowledge to wh whatever you will use AI as a tool to, to accelerate this kind of uh, acquisition, a uh, knowledge acquisition or, or whatsoever. But my, 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 my talk today will focus, will, 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 my, my key point today is that successful adoption of the digital technology, whatever you use, uh, casting, welding, or AUNTD printing to aerospace application is actually largely based upon the fundamental understanding of the material processing to develop, I mean, kind of AI or, or machine learning algorithm for future material and process design. This is about what I'm going to talk to, to you today. The challenge, if you talk about uh, the, 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 how to say, the exciting uh, uh, digital technology called three, metal 3D printing, you, you may know that there's various uh, approach or technique that, that you can do 3D printing. One of which is actually direct laser deposition, that you actually deposit the hot metal, melt hot metal, in, in, into your, 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 your substrate. And then actually the thing happening at the very, very low length scale, if you zoom in, you will see that you see liquid metal moving and then see some, 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 something coming out, a kind of uh, vapor pressure, metal, metric vapor, that which coming out. And this actually will, will govern a lot of uh, property later on. Another the technique and also simulation result that, that people are trying to do, I mean, this is the, the data published uh, recently in 2020 uh, in digital, uh, in additive manufacturing. You will see that, that the detailed information of this uh, micro length scale, about 100 micron here, can give you uh, insight in the, in, in the, the technology, how can you improve, improve it. And, and today, the, the, the talk I'm talking today, I will focus on the, the 3D printing technique, so-called selective laser melting or powder bed uh, fusion additive manufacturing. That uh, if you, you understand that the processing uh, science at, at the very low length scale, you will understand what is the emerging microstructure and, and hence the, 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 the property and performance. 
the research interest that I'm interested in in the past eight, nine years or so is on the computational material science and engineering using the integrated computational material engineering approach. So to, to simulate the liquid metal that, that I mean, using the thermal fluid uh, soluto dynamics uh, 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 technique, and this will apply to uh, latest advanced uh, manufacturing processes like uh, investment casting, uh, laser or electron beam fusion welding, and, and lately digital manufacturing. So if, if you, you look at what is going on in the millimeter length scale, you will see that the fluid dynamics, and now the fluid here is a liquid metal fluid. And then you will see that a lot of things going on is not as simple as you thought at all. And this, how can we simulate or how can we actually predict it somehow in order to, 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 to say about uh, the signature that we can, 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 can bring out from this kind of phenomena uh, to influence the design at, at, at the end. So this is our, our, our first our study back in 2000, probably 14, 15 as well. So we are looking at, at the edge of the, the, the well plate. So we, we, have, we, we can assume that this is 100% packing density. And then we look at what is the interaction of the heat source and the, and the materials. And the, the model here uh, try to capture the uh, solid liquid interface that, that is going on, or you may call so called well, keyhole uh, formation using the high speed camera. And, and this kind of in situ observation, or the, the, someone will call it, uh, uh, I mean, a process monitoring approach here, will give you some kind of validation of your, your, your model, whether your model is, is, is correct or not. This is in order to uh, apply this to more complicated processes like metal 3D printing. And all of this, you, you have to, to deal with some mathematics computer science and, and hence physics. And I mean, this is some kind of uh, a set of equation that you can find as well in my publication in 2018 on how can, can we actually solve and, and go about it. And the, the reason I, I, I mentioned about this because when you decide the additive manufacturing uh, for a specific application, it's, it's not, it's, it's, sorry, it's, it's not actually, you, you want to actually determine the, the property of performance that, that, that you want, and then you will get the, the final product like, like you want. But you, you have to, to understand what is the processing science look like, and that will influence your uh, emerging microstructure and hence property. It's, it's another way around from the previous uh, design uh, principle. So we will say that in this presentation, I, I, I basically use a science push approach to, to, to go about beside the uh, metal 3D printing. And definitely, as a material scientist or material engineer, you know that we're talking about three, or, or, or sorry, four, four strands of, of, of material, which is a material of composition, process, structure, and a property. How can we link all these four together? And for additive, this is quite unique from other process. I will let you know why it's, it's, it's a bit different from other process. So first, I want you to, to look at this 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 the real uh, real time uh, video uh, doing the the direct laser deposition actually taken uh, from uh, I mean at University of Birmingham long time ago. You will see that what a lot of things going on the the mail pool here. This is a liquid metal. The mail pool is is quite it's not very large. I would say is maximum in a millimeter length scale. This is just two hundred micron uh, scale bar here, and then. The, the thing you will see that from this video, you see a lot of phenomena happen here, gas liquid solid uh, interaction, sputter, vaporization, you see a vapor plume now, and then they uh, hence uh, emerging microstructure, dendritic growth or cellular growth or whatever. This need to be understood. This is in order to predict the metal, final mechanical property. And let, let me explain a little bit more on, on this. Lately, people trying to, to visual what is going on in the a bit uh, more detail, I mean, more in, in the spatial uh, length scale. And then you, you will see that if, if you use a, a X-ray synchrotron to, to look at what is going on during the process, you, you, will, you, you, you will see that there are a lot of things going on here, in, including, I mean, if I summarize on, on the right-hand side, 
uh, compared with the high speed imaging here, you have part particle dynamics on the left hand side when you, 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 you have a gas expansion. And definitely the mo one of the most complicated that induce most of the thing is a uh, thermal fluid dynamics uh, uh, behavior during the, the processing as a function of many things that I will mention next. And, and, and subsequent the uh, solid state transformation. I mean, solidification, rapid solidification, rapid repeat solidification behavior. And, and hence the solid mechanics will be very unique because of the, the cooling rate of this process is so extreme. Okay, well, how can we go about that? The first thing is, is, is to how can we actually uh, get an idea of or first simulate what is going on during a powder bed fusion additive manufacturing. So this is an example that you may, if you simulate this, you may go to the two different modes, which is called uh, conduction mode and uh, key holding mode. The, 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 the conduction mode will, will just fuse the powder together and the key holding mode is, will create some, some hole uh, during, during the deposition and hence probably defect or something that people want to avoid. So, this, 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 this model that, that I developed um, uh, some time ago can actually capture those phenomena, the first two. Another thing is that apart from the uh, material behavior itself, about the laser, uh, how to say, physics or, 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 or operation mode is important as well. This will influence your thermal fluid dynamic significantly. So you, you need to, to simulate this one quite, quite carefully. Of, of the interaction in the uh, in the uh, 100 micron length scale, for example. And this is give you some, some three scenario of, of that. And the next thing is, apart from those, uh, those two, another thing is the alloy dependent. If you have uh, two different property or two different materials, you will see different behavior of, 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 the, of, of the melting process during the active manufacturing like, like this one. I mean, this, 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 this tree slide give you some kind of an uh, overview and example of how complicated of the metal additive manufacturing uh, look like. And I, and I summarize a kind of physics that are going on in, in the process because in order to build AI, we may need to have knowledge to, to, to tell the, the, the algorithm what, what, what we are going to, to actually simulate or, 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 or being predicting. And the powder particle dynamics, as I said, phase transition, and then link those the lower length scale information to the higher length scale to predict the property, and hence the solid mechanics and uh, defect formation like cracking or residual development. As I said, the, the nature, the, why we need a, such a very high fidelity modeling to, to, to look at this process because we have this additive process is quite stochastic. So you can't actually keep one condition to the one people in the one machine and you get the same answer. It's impossible. You need to understand the process of this is actually, is random. So you need to have a tool that allow you to give some statistical prediction. What is actually happening in a, in, in, in a, in a acceptable length uh, uh, condition. And this gives you some, some two example of the uh, two different uh, behavior uh, of different uh, process parameter, which is layer thickness and scanning speed, give you totally different uh, surface and subsurface uh, porosity uh, level. And this has to be understood and how can we predict that? This is the question I want to ask. And uh, after the deposition, you may want to say that, okay, how can we know this is good or not? We need to see an overview, much, much uh, broad eye view. And this is a kind of study that's uh, looking at the, the, the effect of processing parameter to the porosity level. You will see that if we vary the, the process parameter uh, carefully, we can avoid a kind of cheese-like structure on, on the right-hand side here. And how can we do that? First, we need to understand what is going on in additive. I don't want to go much into the, the, the deep detail, but I just want to emphasize that additive has a type of rapid and repeat cycle, each cycle, like on, on the, on the left-hand side here in the yellow shade. And you, you will see that 
if if you see this curve carefully, you will know that the material is subject to kind of melting and remelting at least three times in at the same position. So the the, the and and another thing to to mention is that this is a rapid uh, cooling process. So it can be ten to minus five to ten to minus seven uh, centigrade per second. So how can we actually understand this 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 extreme uh, physics and also to to understand the, the emerging microstructure and, and hence property that we can uh, I mean decide or optimize for our uh, specific application. So the the tool that we I, I use in the past uh, many years is the integrated computational science. So we need to link information. That the key here is to link information from the lower length scale to the higher length scale. And this can be done by not only experiment, but also you have to, to, to talk with some model, modeler as well. For example, the hierarchical microstructure. I mean, probably we, we, I start from powder dynamics. When you have a powder, the powder quality is so influenced into the final product. And this, this one, Definitely, the, the link of powder to the microstructure is a processing, which is I, I call it thermal fluid flow or thermal fluid soluto flow. And this is the, 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 the length scale that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at. And hence, you will, will see different in the microstructure will by varying the a key process variable that I mentioned earlier. And this is, this is uh, the kind of focus of, of, of my work in, in the past many years. And this information will be used and useful for for the AI in the future. It's, it's kind of how to say the the knowledge that you use to to train your your model. And I start from the uh, um, powder particle measurement using laser, and then I fit the powder particle, I land it in the bed, and then simulate the a uh, kind of spreading of of the powder in the, the powder based process. And after that, I spread the the, the laser beam. And then looking at what is, I mean, make sure that I capture all the physical phenomenon happen during the process. And hence, we want to actually give to, to use this model to predict something like porosity level. Uh, I, this is an example that I published in computational material science using titanium 6 4 materials. And then you see that the single track experiment match quite well with a modeling result here. On the right hand side, you see the uh, modeling result, which has uh, a good agreement with the, 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 the uh, experiment in terms of the porosity level. And uh, this one can be done using the distributed uh, powder particles. So we can't avoid uh, distribution, both shape and size distribution of powder to actually give some meaningful prediction for industry because porosity is one of the critical things that uh, additive, metal additive people want to know. Apart from that, less, lately, I mean, if you want to do additive manufacturing, another thing you concern is about lightness. Some paper readily say that you need to have the resolution of about few micrometer length, I mean, resolution. If you have too big lightness, this may not be used in the real application. So how can we go about lovingness? So the, the one of the way we can do is use this type of high fidelity model to give you some insight what is actually happening, whether you will get boiling effect or not if you use this process parameter. I mean, this, this is an example that that give you in fact in the Nico Bay Super 71A. And something you see in 2D, probably not real in 3D. This is another thing this slide say to you. Uh, something, if I, I look at from the top, I may not see a kind of balding effect like this. I just see some discontinuity, but some track is look perfect on the top view, but it's not when you, you do 3D tomography. And, and th this kind of, of thing has to, has to implement or actually attach with, with the, the, the 3D printer. These days they are talking about in, in situ or, or lab scale or tomography to check your, your final product. Another thing, once we actually successfully understand the uh, uh, male pool dynamics, we can use the information to, to go further the length scale to predict the grain growth uh, uh, behavior, for example. 
and and this one if if you carefully uh, selected or 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 simulate the, the the condition you may say say see that the the high fidelity model can can give you quite quite good uh, agreement with the experiment i need to to wrap is it about few more slides another thing is that 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 concern metallurgist is the the phase transformation especially solid solid transformation so precipitation is actually so important to govern your metallurgical behavior for example in nickel based super alloy or titanium alloy a two phase structure you want to know about the a precipitation content or secondary phase content that actually uh, embedded in your final product because this will give you whether or not this will fail in, uh, during service and because the uh, spatial signature or thermal signature that I mentioned earlier, that gives the um, uh, distribution of this secondary phase not homogeneous, non homogeneous. I mean, as printed uh, condition, like like the prediction here, which is published in ACTA 2018, and then you 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 will see that the, if if you carefully simulate this, you can have a process window for industrial to use. And then you, you can do AI later. And I, last but not least, I would like to summarize all this in, in this uh, diagram that, okay, if you have two different materials and then you want to know the manufacturability of this, this kind of high fidelity model can give you some insight into the behavior before you actually uh, decide in, in, in the real practice or you invest it. This, this is the two extreme, I mean, uh, nickel-based superalloy, one of which is actually uh, has a lot of gamma palm former or secondary phase former. Another one is actually has lower. And then you, you will see that the behavior of, of, of this in the precipitation kinetics and also across the uh, level is, is different. So this is something dealing with the fundamental understanding on the physical property and, uh, and the thermal fluid behavior that you can look at from the proceeding of Royal Society A, April 2018. And the plan for this has to fill up the, 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 the gap of the AI that we are talking about for alloy and process design. And the future of this is actually establish some kind of high fidelity model that, that integrate a metallurgy and processing to advance the metric, metric material manufacturing. And this is to link these this two together. And um, the, uh, just recently, we we use this kind of principle, uh, so-called the the the, the co alloy by design uh, computational uh, tools to actually decide a new alloy, new super alloy for uh, additive manufacturing, which has uh, less, how to say, crack free uh, alloy, for example. I mean that 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 is something we proud of. At the moment, you can look at uh, at materia, which is online now. And in summary, I would like to say that in computational material science, especially for additive, we need to get summary statistics from from the model or experiment. And then we 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 do use AI as a, a kind of mining tools to to get to improve the material and process uh, condition for for further future. Uh, material development and this one has to deal with the processing structure and property uh, looping here uh, using the causal relationship in order to tell about the performance that that you will you will see in the real component and another thing to do apart from the simulation is about the the challenging in, in the modeling and also sorry in the experiment that we, we may call high throughput uh, investigation that involves so many uh, high level techniques, for example, thermal imaging, non-destructive qualification, and um, a kind of uh, high speed uh, uh, tomography or high speed imaging using a 4D synchrotron, for example. And these all of, of, of scientific and technological challenges will well, 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 if we can, can solve it, we may advance to a next level of, of, of digital technology. 
by doing this, I want to summarize shortly in the, the last one is application of AI can can also be used to simulate all these physical effects. But 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 we need to 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 have something to to know first to link material and process uh, relationship to establish digital material design for the next generation of metal AM. And last but not least, I want to thank uh, all the audience today. And the last word I want to say is that this is the one of the this is the kind of future technology that we are looking for the hybrid uh, uh, electric engine designed by Rolls Royce or hypersonic uh, airplane that you can take time, 90 minutes from London to New York, for example, or flying car here. I want to say that knowledge without technology is missing, but technology without knowledge is impossible. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you. Hello? Hello, hi. Uh, yes, he's still there. <laughs> sure. I think now we are entering the uh, uh, panel discussion. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Jenny Shepard to, to, to actually host or lead this discussion, please. Thank you very I much. Okay, well, it gives me great pleasure to um, chair this question and answer session. And of course, I have to start by thanking um, all our speakers. Um, I know as a relative newcomer to the field of AI for um, materials processing, I've learned a lot. Um, there are already some questions within the chat function um, of this Zoom. If anyone does have any more questions, then please feel free to add them and we'll go through them um, as and when they come up. If you could specify who you were asking the question to, that would be great, um, but feel free to open it to everyone. Um, so in no particular, well, I'll start from the beginning of the questions. Um, so I have a question for uh, Professor Chien Yang. Um, and this is very much about the um, process of your um, um, machine learning. Um, and the question asks, um, why did the study use the matrix that multiplied the corresponding input variables to convert 1D to 2D grayscale images in the convolutional neural network? Um, so I think really trying to understand is there a physical meaning behind the conversion? Professor Yang, you, you mute your microphone, sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can hear you now. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And uh, about the enabled data, and uh, we use the semi and uh, supervised uh, learning and to process the enabled data. And uh, use this method, uh, we can, um, Determined the unable data, for example, and the properties of the materials we don't know uh, with the unable data. And uh, with the semi uh, supervised learning, uh, we can predict and the suit um, suitable and properties of the materials and to, to change the unable data to the labeled data. So uh, we can expand and uh, our uh, and the labeled data. Uh, so uh, we can make a, a more accurate and the prediction and uh, with this method. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've okay. also got a question for, I guess initially for Chinapat, but it can certainly be open more widely about Sure. How accurately can we calculate physical properties of materials through computation and IA, sorry, and AI? And um, how can we go from the micro scale to the lab scale? And actually, I would take that one step forward and say, how relevant is anything we do in the lab to actually the industrial scale? This is quite a tricky equation. So how can we measure the property that relevant for each uh, length scale? Mm -hmm. If I may rephrase your, 
your your simulator yes. and then uh, so, sorry your equation and then how can we make sure that this this simulated property is correct and then yeah. how can we yeah this is something you have to we need to work not only a modeler but we have to work with experimentalists as well to make sure that the, the thing we observe in the modeling or the thing we use in the model sometimes is a causal causal relationship one is have to happen before another one like if you go to the process modeling a type of of, of of scheme you need to make sure that your property is correct first in order to give some meaningful prediction for the industry but for the lower length scale one it's maybe some some something so called a kind of uh, interrelation i mean you you may do some kind of back calculate back a uh, reverse calculation to get the property you want so th th this one is actually ha it, it depends on the length scale you're talking about if you're talking about the the, the fluid a uh, length scale you may need to use some very advanced uh, high resolution high spatial resolution to to look at what is actually happening or going on during the process and then you you link that with the model because you somehow can measure you cannot measure anything uh, um, you can't measure everything you have to 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 use model to to add your your measurement and then hence to get property for example i give you lately a physicist will use a kind of a reverse a model to to predict a viscosity in 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 a, a kind of severe condition once you you do have some lesser interaction for example and then this one will, will give you quite precise property because it's actually coupled experiment and modeling. But if you are talking about industrial length scale for the component uh, manufacturer, you may not need that, that detail. It's, it's may so-called macro scale property. So the macro scale property, for example, you, you may use some kind of tensile uh, uh, machine to, to, to actually test your material and then hence you your generate the property in order to feed into the model and this one has to 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 have an expertise of the people who has experience in solid mechanics for example to to actually uh, understand the behavior and hence that give some predictive uh, capability for 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 the specific target and the challenge here is how can we link all this together the the the, the way we link all this together is not well established yet Sorry to say that. I, I CME community or integrated computational material science and engineering community are working on this in order to link, for example, if you want to link the interfacial energy to the, the melting process, this is something is still going on. It's, it's, it's not as well established. But anyway, we, we, we have some people publish the work, but, but in order to utilize across the length scale to, to get really the multi-scale simulation, it, it, we we still need to do more 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 research uh, as far as I to to the best of my knowledge. Yeah, thank you. I mean, other panelists may have another opinion or against my will. That that's why you are welcome to to do so. Thank you. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Okay, um, so I have a um, question. So from my experience of really applying um, AI to uh, materials processing and properties, the shortfall really seems to always be the data. Um, so within the SUSTAIN project, it was actually really encouraging to see that industry is working together and willing to share their data. Um, and I just wonder whether anyone has any thoughts on whether it is feasible that we can get more widespread sharing of data between industrialists and academics and that we can really push forward um, yeah. applications of machine learning with proper data sharing. Yeah. I think Richard is not here. Oh, may is he not here? You, okay. But I, 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 I may uh, answer this. I mean, uh, uh, probably give, give some thought on this. So, our world now is a digital world, digital age. So it's a charitable society. So everything has to be published by hand and share. And one of the, the things that, that you may, may know is about the uh, journal, that every journal promotes the open access and then data in beef to share your, how to say, best data that you publish in literature. Even now, you, they want you to publish uh, 
unsuccessful data as well. I mean, why, why this is important? Because if we want to use AI, we need to have a kind of very, very best and systematic data correction to correct all data that, that gives some meaningful, uh, how to say, for, for, for the industry. At the moment, I think it's a bit uh, scattered and, and, and random to, to my understanding. The, to overcome this, this challenge, I think we need to, to work toward the government, industrial and university to, from now on, I mean, it will happen. I, especially, I, I think under sustained project, I, I don't know much about, about this project, but I can say that for, for the green economy or sustainable metallurgy that, that they are working on, we're, we're, we're working toward this. Yeah, but I, I can I can say that the community needs to to raise awareness of of this kind of um, data uh, publication as well, and yeah, yeah, this this is this is this is my thought, and I think you you I think we will we we shall see some something uh, in in the in a positive uh, fair, uh, in 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 a positive. Uh, respond in, in, in next few decades. Okay, um, we have one last very specific question um, from, for Professor Yang, um, where it asks in slide 35 is the constitutive equation used to create the four um, neural network models. Slide 35. Is the consistent equation used to create? Yeah, he's on mute again. Uh, yes, you're on mute again. You, you sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, it is not for the uh, creators uh, and uh, artificial neural and uh, network. No. So line number 35. Yeah, I think yes, just... yes. No, the question is no. <laughs> no, no, is no. Okay, no, okay. No, that's the most no. easy answer. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, the answer is no. Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the... yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank, yes, thank you. Um, and another question, um, regarding the applications of AI to materials, is there a certain threshold of error that we need to achieve before we can actually adopt the model for practical usage? And that's to everyone. Uh, to understand the threshold or, or the kind of acceptable threshold of error, we need to to basically understand what, what, what is the error, what is the error is for this specific process. For example, if you give me uh, uh, a chance to, to explain something in metal 3D printing, we, we're not going to predict uh, something in a precise uh, location, but we, we, we let us predict something in a broad range of, of, of the structure, for example, you want, rather than I, I, I predict one point, I will predict kind of distribution, what yeah. is going on. And this distribution will give you or define or give you some kind of error or kind of how can we deviate from, from, from this mean value, for example. I mean, this is uh, some, something people working toward uh, stochastic uh, a finite element calculation, for example. So we need to live in the world of statistics now. If yeah. you, you say about error, that means we need to understand first what is the science of that problem. If you know the science of that problem, you can define the error, <laughs> both experimentally and computationally. Yes, thank you. 